Hey everyone, it is Friday, so we're going to do our video compilation. Um, and this week we've been talking about primary ovarian insufficiency. And I've really appreciated all of you reaching out and asking questions. And it's just been so amazing to, to work with the POI community this week. And um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try and assist you all in, in finding providers that know what, what they're doing with this, or at least can, you know, take you seriously. There's so much misinformation out there. So if you're watching this and you have POI or you know someone who does and you're not getting the help, that you deserve, you know, I'm happy to, to, you know, look at things for you, or you can also check your, um, you know, respective menopause society. So North American menopause society here in North America, uh, British menopause society, there's one in South Africa, there's one in Australia. I mean, like most countries or regions of the world will have that. Um, so that's a, a place to go for information. And then obviously, if you're looking for things in terms of fertility, you know, talk with a fertility specialist. They know kind of what to do with these. So anyway, kind of to, to put everything together. So remember, primary ovarian insufficiency has gone through kind of a, um, a name change over the past few years. When I was in training, it was called premature ovarian failure. And now it's kind of morphed into this new, um, newer kind of nomenclature. But basically what's going on is that there is a deficit in ovarian hormone production that occurs prior to the age of 40. So that's kind of your cutoff point. Now there are two main kind of subtypes, if you will, of this. One is for patients who have more of an autoimmune PUI is something, you know, their body is attacking the ovary, it's causing the ovaries not function as well. And they will typically have more of a slower decline kind of an ovarian function. On the other hand, you have patients that have more of a, uh, what we call iatrogenic POI or kind of, um, you know, physician or medication induced. So this is someone who, let's say, has her ovaries removed for um, endometriosis or ovarian cancer or goes through chemotherapy and the medication that is used basically goes in and just destroys ovarian function. Now I had some patients, or excuse me, some people reach out um, talking about being diagnosed prior to going through puberty. And this is a really interesting thing because when we talk about pediatric gynecology, and I may talk about that at some time in the future, you have to look and see what's going on from a hormonal standpoint that's causing that pubertal kind of change in things. So can you have POI prior to, to puberty? I mean, I guess technically, but you know, we typically would classify that as either what's called a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, kind of talking about how the brain is talking to the ovaries. And so, like I said, I'll talk about that in a, in a further video. I'll probably do that here sometime soon. Um, but back to POI. So in these subsets of patients, the, the main issue is that the main ovarian um, sex hormones, so estrogens, so that would be mostly estradiol, but also estriol, estrone, estetrol, kind of in smaller amounts, progesterone and testosterone are reduced in their, um, basically in production. Uh, when those um, hormones are decreased in production, the tissue that is receptive to them starts to get very aggravated and starts to kind of respond in a symptomatic way. And this will typically lead to symptoms such as like hot flashes or night sweats or vaginal dryness for low estrogen. Um, you may see some issues with sleep disturbances, kind of mood things uh, with progesterone. Progesterone also um, in low amounts causes water retention. And so some patients may feel really bloated or they may feel very swollen um, in different areas. And then in terms of testosterone, we typically would see a decrease in energy. We may see some kind of joint pain and a change in sex drive as well. And, and there's a lot of other symptoms that kind of overlap, but those would be kind of your generic kind of hormonal symptoms. Now, obviously, most of us have heard of kind of textbook menopausal symptoms. You know, these patients that are very, you know, they're really irritable and they're having trouble sleeping and they're going through four articles of clothing a day because they're sweating so much. And obviously that can happen. But you have to remember that no one is an absolute in terms of medicine. So everyone exists on a spectrum. So your symptoms may be different from the person next to you who has POI, who's different from there and the person next to them. So if you start to have these menopausal quote unquote symptoms and you're under the age of 40, it behooves you to talk to a healthcare provider about this. And you can bring this up, say, hey, I'm concerned. You know, what's going on? Am I going through menopause? I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this. It's a very easy way to evaluate, you know, POI in terms of laboratory functioning. We look at basically a, a couple of different hormones. First, um, we would look at an estradiol level. 
And um, typically in a menopausal range, we'd expect to see that below a 25. Now, throughout a normal menstrual cycle, estradiol can go anywhere from, you know, mid 30s all the way up to 300 sometimes. So it's really also very important to, to, to know where in your cycle you are when you get these labs tested because that will kind of dictate things too. You can check a progesterone. Progesterone is almost undetectable prior to ovulation. So, you know, if you're not ovulating, uh, well, you probably are going to have a, a low progesterone. It doesn't mean it's, it's absent. There's a problem with it. It just normally is low then. Testosterone levels also really only kind of surge around ovulation. So baseline testosterone, you know, if, if is it, it's variable from people. Now there are certain levels who say, hey, that's really low. You need to, to go that. But if your average, you know, provider is looking at the lab ranges supplied by the lab, you know, where I was in the past, our lab said a free, normal free testosterone range was between zero and five. Zero is never normal like in this. So so that's wrong. So you can't just look at the, the lab and say, oh, it didn't flag it abnormal, so it must be normal. The other two things we really want to look at is what one, uh, what's called gonadotropin, or a hormone that comes out of your brain uh, called follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. Now, FSH's main role is to cause the follicles in the ovary to stimulate. Um, and as they stimulate, they are, or as they are stimulated, they start producing more estradiol. Um, so in order to get that to happen, the brain releases more and more FSH out of your pituitary gland. But if the ovary is not responding, let's say it's not functioning well, or if it's not there, um, that FSH is just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. It's kind of like trying to work with a, a thermostat or, a, you know, a thermometer or kind of a wall, you know, heating and, and, and cooling unit. If it's broken, you can crank that thing up as high as you want. It's not going to do anything. And so that's what we see a lot of times in patients that have, you know, POI is that their FSH will be very, very elevated. Um, you know, typically 30, 40, 50, sometimes even higher than that. Another hormone is anti-mullerian hormone now, or AMH. AMH is typically used in the fertility sector to kind of look to see how well a patient will respond to an artificial reproduction um, kind of cycle like IVF or something like that. But it can give you an overall idea of the number of follicles, um, and antral follicles specifically, that are in the ovary. And these are the ones that really have eggs that are starting to kind of develop. If that AMH is less than one, then you start to have issues and you have to say, okay, well, what's going on here? So if a patient presents saying, man, I've got hot flashes, night sweats, you know, you draw a lab, her estradiol is 15, her FSH is 50, and her AMH is, you know, 0 0.01, well, you know, you're looking at kind of menopausal ranges. And if she, especially if she hasn't had a period um, for, you know, six months, a year, something along those lines, and she's 32 or something, well, there's your diagnosis, POI. So, you know, the next thing to look at this is, okay, well, let's say we find this patient, what do we do? Well, there's two different ways of approaching therapy. There's kind of fertility standpoint, and then there's kind of lifestyle. And these overlap a little bit. But the big thing, you know, from kind of lifestyle and, and kind of further healthy living is that in patients who have this very decreased gonadal hormone levels, um, it can lead to a lot of other complications down the line, osteoporosis, cognitive issues such as dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, um, you know, not to mention things like um, low sex drive, um, joint aches, you know, things like uh, weight gain. That's another thing we see a lot with this as well. Um, so it's imperative that these patients be on some form of systemic hormone therapy up until the age of natural menopause, which here in the U.S. is between 51 and 52. Um, if they have a uterus, that means doing not only a, an estrogen supplementation, usually estradiol, but also then a progestin. And in this case, we typically would use progesterone. Um, and the reason we do those two is because unopposed estrogens within a patient who has a uterus, um, meaning there's no progesterone there, can increase the chance for endometrial cancer, which is bad. We don't like that. So um, this can be done either with an oral medication, it can be done with a transdermal preparation. Um, you know, th there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, and if you find one, you're like, man, that didn't work. I didn't like how I felt with this or, you know, the, the adhesive on the patch gave me a, a blister or something like that. 
there's t so many different ways to do this. Like try other ones and the medication that's in them may be different too. There's a difference between, between you know, um, uh, ethanol estradiol, estradiol valerate, um, you know, uh, just regular old estradiol. There's all, all sorts of different formulations there. Same with the progestins as well. Norethindrone, levonogestrel, I don't know, just, I mean, it's just a bunch. So typically it's not a reaction to the hormone. It's a reaction either to the specific subset of hormone that's there or the carrier method in which you're getting that hormonal medication. Um, and we see this a lot in, in, in patients who say, man, I put that estrogen cream on and oh my gosh, I felt so horrible. My broke out and all these things. It's probably the base that the cream is in, not the estrogen. Because remember, we, you, you cannot have an allergy to an endogenous hormone. You do not have an allergy to estradiol or you would not have been alive because everyone makes estradiol from the moment like they're a fetus, they're developing, they are making these hormones. It's like saying I'm allergic to steroids. Well, st no, steroids like corticosteroids, gluteco like glucocorticoids, all those different subtypes, your body's making them all the time. So typically you'd be allergic to the preparation of that exogenous steroid or something we're giving you. It's not the actual steroid itself or the actual hormone itself that's causing a problem. Now, dietary things, that's a little bit different and, and there's obviously all exceptions. But I have patients say, I'm allergic to progesterone. Well, did you, you know, have you had periods? Well, yeah, I've had periods. You're not allergic to progesterone. Like your body is making progesterone, you're having periods, like it's there. We could value, uh, you know, it's the preparation of that exogenous, exogenous hormone that's giving you the issues. On the fertility side of things, now this gets a little bit trickier because you have to figure out, you know, okay, how are we going to optimize the chance for kind of spontaneous conception? And this is why early diagnosis of POI is so important. So, you know, if you know that you are going to have to have your ovaries removed, or you are gonna go through medical treatment that is most likely gonna make you menopausal, this is when you would talk to a fertility specialist and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have surgery for endometriosis. Uh, it's so bad, I've tried everything, I just have to have my uterus and my ovaries removed. Can you please do, you know, egg banking? Or if you're going to go through chemotherapy, before you start that, talk to a fertility specialist about doing egg banking or things along those lines. So you can have that chance to have your eggs response while they are while your ovaries hopefully are acting in, an, in um, a way that is not going to be problematic for fertility. Now for, pa for patients that have more autoimmune POI, like I said, early detection is paramount because as, you know, time is eggs in this and as time passes and as there is more and more autoimmune assault on the ovaries, that number of eggs declines. And this is something I don't know how many people realize, but you know, um, ovaries have a limited number of eggs. You don't, you don't really make more eggs throughout your life. You know, now some people say, well, what about, you know, stem cells and things? And, and we could talk about that in a, in a future time. But for the average person, whoever they may be, they have a limited number of eggs. Unlike testicles, which are completely or like we're reproducing or producing sperm all the time. So, you know, it's a, it's a, the difference in commodity. Eggs are much more valuable than sperm. I mean, you know, and a normal amount of ejaculate contains literally millions of sperm and only takes one to cause fertilization. So the rest of those other million, will they die, you know? So sperm, whatever, who cares? But eggs are very, very, very valuable. So if you know that, if you're like, man, I'm having these symptoms, things are going on. My family has a strong history of autoimmune diseases, or, you know, I myself have other autoimmune diseases really kind of, you know, perk your ears up with this to see, is this something that may be, you know, worth talking to a fertility specialist? And in my opinion, if you think it may be, it probably is, you know, at least talking to a gynecologist or someone who knows what they're doing with this so they can give you an idea about, hey, where to go from here. Now, uh, ways that we can look at, at, you know, ways to improve ovarian function in these patients, if you have known autoimmune issues, would be to try and reduce that overall inflammation. So, you know, and this, you get into a lot of, of kind of alternative therapies for this, you know, looking at things like dietary changes, kind of low inflammatory diets, stress reduction, um, um, you know, kind of different types of supplements to improve ovarian function. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing any of those. You know, can I tell you, if you eat this diet and you do this, you're gonna, you know, maintain ovarian function for this number of years? No, 
And that's that's an, an issue when we talk about nature-suiticals or kind of alternate therapies. It's hard to get you know absolute yeses or nos with them. It's it's very individualized, and people metabolize things differently. Um, for a lot of patients with chronic autoimmune issues, so let's say you have something like Crohn's disease or Hashimoto's, you know, thyroiditis or something along those lines. I have a, a patient, a good number of them, that I put on a medication called low-dose naltrexone. Now, it's here in the U.S. I'm not sure about other parts of the world. Naltrexone is an opioid, um, basically, a, a antagonist in large amounts. It goes in, and if you were to go to the emergency department and have been taken accidentally a whole bottle of painkillers, you know, they would give you uh, naltrexone or Narcan, is kind of the trade name here, to reverse that. It kind of blocks those opioid receptors. Um, in very low doses, however, it has a paradoxical effect in that it basically causes an, an anti-inflammatory type response. And so there's lots of little kind of, you know, studies here and there and kind of more empiric data um, about using it to treat autoimmune conditions. And I, mean, I have patients who are on it that have really fantastic response, you know. Now, granted, they're doing it for things like endometriosis or interstitial cystitis. Um, POI patients, you know, I always am very aggressive with them um, because I, I want to make sure if they want to have kids, they have that chance to. But even if they don't, well, let's still try and keep them, you know, kind of as normal um, ovarian functioning as much as possible. So, you know, that's definitely something to consider. Um, like I said, in terms of diet, you're looking at basically autoimmune protocol type diet. So low inflammatory, or, you know, zero inflammatory foods, you know, no dairy, gluten, grains, things kind of in those lines. And you can find there's a bunch of different autoimmune type diets out there. Um, so you could try and find one that works for you. Now with sexual functioning in POI, once again, we kind of have a couple things to address. We have not only the physical aspect of it, you know, with, with these patients can develop um, something akin to genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is a change in the architecture of the uh, reproductive tract. It causes thinning and, and kind of narrowing of the vagina. The glands that typically produce secretions with sexual activity kind of become more irritated and, and don't produce as much. You can get more chronic urinary tract infections, more chronic yeast infections. And so it's very important that these patients be on some sort of, you know, estrogen supplementation for those vaginal reasons. And even if this means just doing a straight vaginal estrogen, which, which I would still prefer you to be on systemic therapy, but if you're absolutely opposed to that, um, at least a vaginal estrogen to maintain, you know, like there, there's, there's so many benefits to that. And we can talk about that another time where you can talk out Dr. Rachel Rubin on social media. She's like the world's largest proponent of vaginal estrogen. Um, she has a lot of, of great stuff out there. But, um, you know, looking at this from a sexual health standpoint, from the actual, you know, act of sexual, um, act, you know, act of activity. So penetrative, you know, sexual activity, reducing pelvic pain, dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse and things as a relationship to a low hormone state. So making sure that that's being addressed, but also addressing the emotional side of things. You know, obviously a lot of these patients feel very broken and they feel their body has betrayed them. And, you know, I'm 25. Why am I menopausal? What's wrong with me? All my friends are having, you know, like their best life and good sex life and whatever it may be. And I'm, you know, on hormone therapy because I, you know, am menopausal. So, you know, for patients who have this, I think once again, it's very, very important to talk with a, you know, counselor and definitely like a sex therapist too, to really help you kind of come to terms with, you know, this new, new you. And obviously there are things we can do to improve it, you know, so this is not like a helpless type thing, but addressing it and looking at it and focusing on it is of paramount importance too, because you have to be comfortable with yourself in order to be comfortable with your sexual self. So um, we're almost at 20 minutes for this video. I've really appreciated, you know, um, like I said, the chance to talk with you all. Um, obviously, you know, like and subscribe. Um, I will talk to you all next week. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm Dr. Corey Babb. Have a wonderful weekend and take charge of your own health.